Say you ought to be thankful to be alive. Come on. Look alive. Good to see all of you. Some of you haven't seen for a while. See you online. Kinda. Posts and stuff, but it's a good day today. How many relieve that? Amen. Every day's a good day. Amen. Amen. Even when rich is mean. Father, I praise you for life. I praise you for the privilege to live it. I praise you for this place. I praise you for your presence. That you're a God that never leaves us or forsakes us. Faith forsakes us. That you are truly Emmanuel, God with us. Not only are you with us, but I pray today, God, it become revelation to us that we are with you. I give you praise. I give you glory and honor. Be glorified in all that we do, we pray. No flesh be exalted in your presence. Pray for those that can't be here today for whatever reasons, from sickness to things they're going through, God, that your presence would invade the place they are. For all those watching online, God, that they would see you, they would hear you, they would feel you. Because we know when you're revealed, everything changes. God, those that are traveling on vacation, different things, I plead the blood of Jesus over them. Pray your protection on them, your blessing, your favor on them. For them to be rested, rejuvenated, spend the time with their family. Bless them, I pray. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done in our lives in every single area, I pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you agree with me, say amen.
scripture that says that every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is still, not was, but he is. He is everything that you need today. here today first time visitors raise your hand we just have a little gift for you over here welcome good to see you we have a nursery and kids church in the back as always uh, baptism and baby dedication signups are at the back table and you can also sign up online uh, next week we'll have guests here John and Gail Rowlett will be here so we're looking forward to that uh, birthdays and anniversaries. We we missed a couple last week, so we need to point those out. Uh, July 9th, Dean Oliver had a birthday. Happy birthday, Dean. Belated. And uh, Chase and Kylie Conaway and Rick and Javina Stansberry had anniversaries last week. So we wish them a happy anniversary. Today, Heather Dowling has a birthday. Happy birthday, Heather. And Ryan and Colby Lewis have an anniversary. Happy anniversary. More anniversaries tomorrow, uh, Trevor and Ricky Oliver, and Chris and Cena Bailey. So happy anniversary to them. And this week's upcoming birthdays, Alyssa Conaway, somebody remind her husband, and uh, Sherlane Raby. Happy birthday coming up to them. I'm so thankful for the families here at NCC. We're excited. We love to celebrate their lives. Amen. And their families and the futures and anniversaries and, and we just honor you today. I'm thankful for you. Father, we thank you again that you are great, you are good. We thank you, Jesus, because no matter what we are going through, said that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You are walking right beside us. I'm thankful for that. We came to this place, God, not to just sing songs and not just to get together and celebrate life with each other, but to celebrate who you are and all your goodness, all your mercies that you have bestowed on our lives. We honor you for that today, and we are thankful. If you agree with me, say amen. Then sings my soul.
somebody that's, that's been through cancer or been through sickness and disease and things like that it's like there's certain things that when you say that name of whatever it is everybody's like well that's it but how many are thankful that his name is above every name I heard a preacher say one time years ago if you can name something you can kill it and I, I'm just thankful that that's that name above all names there's so much power in the name of Jesus just declaring that name does something. I, I, it just it rises up out of our soul. It's, it's, it's like when Mary and Elizabeth got together. You, you hear the voice of your beloved. You hear the name of it. And, and we used to just sing that song. Uh, there's something about the name of Jesus. There's different versions of it. But I don't know. It's just stirring in me this morning. I want us to just take our time and worship. If you have somebody, you're going through a situation, whatever it is, I want you just to focus in, forget about everything else today, and just begin to focus in on Him, on that name, that that name is above every name. That name carries weight. That name has defeated everything that we deal with or will deal with. And He is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I, as Lynn says it, you have an attorney on retainer, and his name is Jesus. He forever lives to litigate, the Bible says. He's your in-between. He's your guide to represent you. How many know he's perfect? Amen.
wanted to turn left but not at 50 miles an hour and I turned thinking okay at least I'm I think I'm going in the right direction and I turned my wheel to the left and once I got a little closer and the fog had cleared there was an embankment that I was getting ready to run into I didn't holler for my husband although he's next in line I didn't holler for anybody else. But the last thing that came out of my mouth was Jesus. Because I knew he was the only one that was going to be with me if this was the end. I didn't expect it to be the end. My airbag didn't even go off. But I give that praise and glory to Jesus. Because if you're fighting something in your life right now, 
And if you are faced up against a wall right now, I want you to know that he is the one. His name is powerful. It is above all names. It is above all walls in this land. It is above all things. No matter what it looks like around us, no matter what people might be saying around us, when you call out to the name of Jesus, he is there in a split second, probably in what's less than a second, a nanosecond. He is there just at the mention of your name. And I know not, I'm not the only one that has called out his name in a time of need, in a time of fear, in a time of panic. Amen? If you have called out on his name, I want you to give him some praise this morning and say, Jesus, Woo! you are the only one that is going to be with yeah. me no matter what is going on in my life. Amen. No matter when people walk away Come from on. me, no matter when people turn their backs on me, Jesus, you are the one that is only going to be there for me no matter what. Yes. His name is above all names and nothing can stand against that. Amen. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Oh, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Jesus is the name, the name of Jesus. five about four people make sure they're looking before you sit down I had a friend growing up in church you can be seated this morning I had a friend growing up in church Dave Dave was his name David he's kind of a neighbor kid of ours and we ran around together got in a little bit of trouble but uh, he used to say growing up in Sunday school church he said if you want to get the answers right in Sunday school 95% of the time, just say Jesus. Amen? Wasn't that right? That's right. That's how it works. If you want to get things right in your life, how many know 90, 95% of the time the answer is Jesus. Jesus? It's still Jesus. Amen? His ways, His character, is His word, His light, His direction, whatever it is. If you want to get it right, it's usually something about Jesus. Amen? We've got a special treat this morning. Crystal, would you come? Um, she's going to share maybe just a song, maybe a little background for it. I don't mind if you want to do that. She may have some help. Is he going to help you or sit by me? Okay. You want to come sit with me? That's a rare occasion. <laughs> oh, it was you that he was wanting to sit by, not me. Yeah. Would you well, welcome he did Crystal have a crush this morning? On you the first Sunday, so. <laughs> I can't decide if I'm actually supposed to give you a little information on this or, or not. Um, if I do, it's terrifying. Um, <laughs> this song uh, was written about 18 years ago, and I cry all the time, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> it was at a crossroads in my life. And um, to me, the details are pretty important and significant, but I don't know that that's the importance today. So, and Cassie just put it together <laughs> the rest of the way. See you in all 
Would you clear the path ahead and show me the ways of your wisdom so that I can understand? Wasn't that good? Amen. Her son looked over at me when she finished. He said, my mom is a good singer. Yeah. Oh, she is. Thank you for sharing that. Amen. Sharing your story. 18 years. 18 years. Come from a prayer 18 years ago. And now it's a song. How many know God can take a situation you're going through and turn it into a song that you'll sing that will help other people? Say all things work together for good. Even the hard times and the times you can't see, you don't know where you're going. God's like, I can use that. I think of the first miracle that Jesus performed He's at the wedding, and his mom just gives him the look. <laughs> they got a situation. Any of you men in here had your mom or your wife give you the look? I think, I th I think it's a woman thing. It's the look. Yeah, you know, don't you? <laughs> I know your wife. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> sort of. And so we need to let the kids be dismissed to children's church. Mark, set, Go. Yeah, give him a hand. You made him. <laughs> Clap for what you made. <laughs> so one thing about our church is y'all are productive. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, they just keep having babies. That's a good thing, amen? There's a hope and a future. Hope and a future. 
trying to decide how to do this. I had it planned out during worship, and then I'm second-guessing myself. How many, are there two people in here that would back me up while I preach? Rich, Ed, yeah? Come here. Bring a chair. Both of you. Bring a chair. Yeah. Yeah. Put, put one chair right here. Try to watch the cords. And put another chair right beside. Just put them right there in the middle. Yeah, right behind me. I like having backup. Not yet. Okay, you, you can go sit down. I'm going to call you back up. Pick a number between 1 and 10. You're Jesus when you come back. Okay, go ahead and sit down. Don't go far. I'm going to have you come back. Stay with me. We're going somewhere today. How many like my hat? Please don't be offended and that it's disrespectful or anything like that. I'm selling merchandise. I'm advertising, all right? <laughs> Just a little reminder of the merchandise that's out front. Um, it helps us uh, with missions. We've done things uh, with foreign missions through it. Uh, the, all the proceeds are profits that come from it. Um, we're using to finish building the redemption truck. And so if there's anything out there that you see, please uh, get with Kendra. Or if you're watching online, um, there's, there's going to be uh, online availability for some of that stuff as well. Um, stay tuned for that be able to order some of that, but all, like I said, all the proceeds are going to be going towards uh, some of our missions, endeavors, and so we're excited about that, so um, I thought I'd just feel more comfortable like some of y'all today, amen? How many ever have trouble making decisions? <laughs> all the rest of you, we know you do too sometimes, you don't have to be honest, Um I'm just going to take my time today, and uh, that doesn't mean I'm going to go a long time for those of you that just went, oh, man. I want to talk today about how do we make decisions. Decisions are very important. They have an effect that lasts a lifetime and beyond for generations. How many believe that? The decisions we make have an effect. Amen? Now, stay with me because I'm not going to just, I, I, I want you to understand where I'm going with this. Um, we all make them, and we know we have to, and we know that the decisions we make are transformative, absolutely no doubt. Amen? How many have made a decision that transformed the rest of your life or that affected the rest of your life? Amen? How many got married? Affected the rest of your life. I said affected, not infected. And so... Um, but they, they and, and we need to be able to make good decisions. And one of the things that I have noticed and that I, I believe the Lord's really dealing with me about is in this transformation stuff that we're talking about this year is making decisions. And how do we make good decisions and why are we making bad decisions? Anybody ever made bad decisions? Amen. Really regretted making the decisions you made, but you made it. I heard a... a, a, a a uh, preacher that I like a lot make the statement one time. He said, uh, no decision or a bad decision is better than no decision. Indecision is always going to turn out bad. Amen? You know that. But, um, and, and, and so decisions are important. But the question and topic I want to talk about today is how do we make transforming decisions correctly? And I believe we either make decisions out of one of two things, fear or faith. If you just think about that with me for a little bit this morning, most decisions, if not all the decisions we make, we make them based on one of two things, fear of what might happen, what could happen, if I do this, what about this, or faith, what might happen, what could happen in a good way, or what will happen, I think this is going to happen, so I'm going to decide to go this way. Does that make sense? So it's really pretty simple. So I, I don't want you to get bogged down or, or, or think that it's going to be a super deep revelation this morning. I'm not after that. But I, I do believe that we make most decisions out of fear or faith. How many know that the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith? The Bible says that anything that's not of faith is sin. 
How many want to make decisions out of anything other than faith? Do you ever think about it like that? Anything that's not of faith is sin, the Bible said. See, we always look at sin as, as actions or things that we do instead of the way we think and things like that. Anything that's not of faith is sin. So if, we're, if I'm making a decision based on fear, how many know that's sin? Nobody likes that. Because sin is truly just mark missing. Sin is just missing the mark for your life. All have sinned and fall short of the glory, the purpose of God in our life. We all have done that, but that doesn't mean we need to keep doing that. Amen? How many remember when, he, when the woman caught in the act of adultery is thrown at Jesus' feet? He didn't say, well, you screwed up. Uh, go ahead. Just keep going. No, he said, go and sin no more. I forgive you. Neither do I condemn you. So based on now, there is therefore no condemnation in your life, lady. Nobody can come against you anymore. You have no accusers, and neither do I accuse you or condemn you. Now go and quit missing the mark. That's not who you are. Amen. Does that, does that make sense? Stay with me. I'm gonna, we're gonna, this just gets better all the time to me. And that's what I want to talk about. Making decisions has everything to do with perspective. How many agree with that? If you've, if, if, when you get ready to make a decision, you want to, if you make good decisions, just intellectually and, and being smart about things, you want to gather all the information that you have concerning the situation, look at that, and then make a good decision. Amen? And that's great. But also, you need to make those decisions based on faith. So perspective is very important. How many agree with that? I'm asking a lot of questions, and there's a reason. How many know that depending on your position or location, there is a huge difference on how and what you see or how you see a situation? How many know as a worker or someone who's working for someone else, you see the situation that you have going on at work from one perspective? As the boss or the owner of the company, you see it from a different perspective. Amen? Pretty simple. <clears throat> I got squeaky voice. Um, so depending on your location and where you're seated, how many know that it, uh, it, it affects how you see things, which would affect how you respond or how you deal with something? How many would agree that making a decision from a better position would be better? I'd like to be able to make my decisions from a better position. I, I, how many have ever made decisions in your life when you're freaked out? I mean, that's not a good position to be making decisions from. That's why it's so dangerous to live freaked out. Because you do stupid stuff. Amen? I've done it. We've all done it. And so this particular verse that I want to get into this morning just hit me. And, and it just keeps getting, it keeps getting deeper. So I'm just, just kind of dragging and taking my time because I don't know how, how far we'll even go with this stuff this week, next week, or whatever. But... Making a decision from a better position would be good. If you see things from a better position or perspective, I think we all would make better decisions. Amen? I want to read a verse, a couple of verses. Let's start with Colossians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, Colossians chapter 3. Starting in verse 1. says, If then... Everybody say if. You were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above. Where Christ is. Sitting at the right hand of God. Just stay on that first verse. Where's Christ? Where, where is Christ? Talk back to me today. I want you throwing stuff at each other before this service is over. In a good way. And you should if you get a hold of what I'm trying to tell you this morning. Where is Christ seated? Where is Christ seated? Say it again. Where is Christ? It's a right hand. He's at the right hand of God. If then you were raised with Christ. Come on. Where's Christ seated? 
Where is his position? Come here, Christ. I want you to get a hold of this. I'm just getting started. Sit down here, Jesus. Sit down here. Let's just say God the Father's right here. Well, you better move over here. Depending on perspective. How many know from my perspective, he's at the right hand of the Father if the Father's right here. But from your perspective, he's on the weak side. Everybody say the left side's a weak side. Don't get offended if you're left-handed. The Bible always talks about the right hand of God, the right arm of God. I will remember Psalm 77. David said, I will remember the right hand of Almighty God when I'm depressed, when I'm going through stuff. I, I'm going to forget about what my soul says this, my soul says this, my mind, will, and emotion says this. And then all of a sudden in Psalm 77, he has this revelation. Asaph says this, the, David's chief musician. He says, but I will remember the right hand of God. Where's Christ? He's seated. All his works were finished from the foundation of the world. When Jesus got done, he said, it is. Work's over. I've accomplished it. It's done. And he went and sat down. Isn't it amazing the first time that Jesus gets up to preach in your Bible? The Bible says that he opens up the book of Isaiah and he, he quotes a prophecy from years before of, of what he would be. And then he says, and this day... This scripture is fulfilled, filled full in your ears. He was talking to a group of people sitting right there in front of him, and he's saying, today, this verse from way back then, 18 years ago, today, that thing came fulfilled. And what did he do? He sat down, and everybody in church freaked out. You know why? Because there was a seat literally reserved for the Messiah when he would come. And Jesus went and sat in that seat in the temple. And everybody flipped out and got mad. And they wanted to kill him. That's why they tried to take him out and tried to kill him. Because he sat down in the seat. He took his position and he said, here I am. Where's Christ? He's seated at the right hand of God. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. Where's Christ? Rich, I need to ask you something. From your perspective, do things look different in here than they normally do from where you're sitting? Whole different view from here, huh? Yeah. <laughs> he said, I see people sleeping already. Wake up. Elbow the person next to you. Say, wake up. Your position from where you're seated, from how you see something, you, you see it differently from a different position. I know this sounds elementary, but stay with me. It's going to get like the gears are just going to go hum here in a minute. <laughs> Some of them already have. Ephesians chapter 2. Just start in verse uh, 5. The Bible says, even when we were dead in our trespasses... He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised up together and made us sit together in where? Come here. Come here, us. This is us. This is, this is Christ and this is us. I may feel like that's a pretty good representation of yourself right there. That's me. Where's Christ? Where's us? Right beside him. That's what your Bible says. I didn't make this up. Your Bible says, and is reminding the people at Ephesus, you have been raised up together and has made. Everybody say made. That's past tense. Sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Go ahead, next verse. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Where's us? Sitting next to Christ. Where's Christ? At the right hand of the Father. Thank you, guys. 
Do you get that? You can leave him there. That's fine. I probably should have had you stay. So I was going to get into approaching the throne. Come, come back up here. Yeah, come back up here. Just stay up here. You guys look good anyway. I like having backup. Get your steps in. All right. So think with me. If then, everybody say if, if Christ is seated with him, and if you and I are with him in the same position, how many of you would that affect <clears throat> the way you make decisions? If you could see yourself and understand, I'm sitting right here. I'm not going to heaven someday to sit by him. I am already, as far as God's concerned, seated right here in heavenly places with Christ. I am no longer going to the throne like this and begging and asking God to do some things. When I talk to God now, I'm just like, what do you think? Look at the situation. How do you see that, Jesus? That's how I see it. I see it the same way you see it. That's already been dealt with, hasn't it? We just need to declare what's already done here, don't we? We don't need to ask and beg and say, Jesus, would you please, would you please, oh God, would you please hear my prayer? Would you please hear my prayer? Oh God, please, I'm just a humble servant. This isn't arrogant. This is factual. This is the confidence that we have in him. I didn't do anything to get here. He made me sit here. He's the one that because of what he did, he put me in right standing with God. I am now seated in heavenly places with him. And so when I go to think about anything and make a decision about anything, I want my mind to match up with what the Spirit says about me and my life and my position with God. And my position with God will greatly affect everything I see and do. I want to see things from His perspective. I want to see things the way he sees them. And if my mind and my thinking is to the point of I'm this poor, wretched, miserable sinner just coming and begging to God and hoping he might answer my prayer this time. I don't know what I did wrong, but one time he answers my prayer, one time he doesn't. I just don't know how it is. And then I'm just going to step off in it. i got to get this out of my way. How many know if you're seated right here, why do you need to bombard the gates of hell? I'm going to mess with some theology for a little bit. Why do we need to go bombard the gates of hell? Last time I checked, Jesus took the keys of death and hell. He took them and he went and sat down with them. How many know the gates are open? He went and opened the gates of hell so people could come out. He emptied out hell. He went down into hell while he was dead and buried. And by the way, you were with him. Tell your neighbor we went together because my Bible says I was crucified with Christ. I was buried with him and I resurrected with him. And now where am I? I am seated with him in heavenly places. I don't know how this ain't good news to you. But while we were dead and buried, we went with Jesus down into hell and preached to those who were sometimes disobedient heaven wasn't an option yet unless you kept the law perfectly that's where you were he went down and preached to them what did he preach to them have you ever wondered what did Jesus preach in hell same thing I've defeated it you're free to go your sins are forgiven Get up and walk out of here. I used to sing a song when I was a little boy called Little Boy from the Carpenter Shop. Dwayne Friend wrote it. And there was a certain part of that song, a phrase in, or a, a part of that song that said that out of the devil's prison house came a procession led by the king. 
And it says another place in there that he, that he shook hell's gates and he cried, lift up your heads. The king's coming through. I need to tell somebody today, you need to lift up your heads. The king came through. And the gates have been ripped off the hinges. There is no more gates of hell for you and I to bombard. We don't need to bombard and do anything if we understand where we're seated. If we understand our position. From our position, how many know we can just declare a thing? And the reason we don't do that is we don't believe that's where we're seated. We still think we're out here somewhere, and we still think that heaven's up here somewhere, and that we're going to go there someday, and someday it's going to be good, and someday I'm going to be with him instead of the same problem the children of Israel had. They never could call it today. Today, if you will harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the wilderness. Remember that scripture? If the children of Israel, for 40 years, they kept thinking someday, someday, But if we'll get that today mentality and understand our position with God, our position in Christ is right beside him, right beside God, how many would that change your perspective? I used to struggle with so much spiritual warfare mentality. And don't let me offend you this morning because I've been, I've done it all. I, I can tell you systematically how I got to where I got. I, I agree with Lynn 100%. I may be out of your mind, but I'm not out of mine. And I can tell you exactly how I got to this place. Because I kept doing everything they told me to do and everything people were preaching and everything. And, and then it wouldn't work. And then I'm thinking, well, if this happened, then why are we doing this? If it's finished, what am I doing? If this is where I'm truly seated, then why am I out here trying to beat up the devil? I thought Jesus finished that. If, if God's going to judge the devil someday, then why does the scripture say and why did Jesus say, now is the enemy cast out? Now is he judged? And I started thinking this doesn't make sense. And then I started reading these scriptures and I started seeing this stuff. He just keeps talking about where we are. We have been made. You're already there. Tell your neighbor you're already there. Have you ever just woke up and realized something in your life? Anybody ever been woke? I'm messing with you. Come on. Have you ever just woke up and thought, wow, God was there the whole time. He was in the middle of my mess. He was, the, he was, he was right there. I think about Jacob, the night Jacob has the dream. And Jacob's laying there. The Bible says that he... He was in a certain place, and he lays down, he has this dream, and he wakes up, and he dreams, and he dreams about this ladder, and these angels ascending and descending to heaven. Say connection. We could just come and go into the heavenlies. We could just, we could, we're just, we're already there. And he wakes up, and he wakes up. And what does he say when he wakes up? He said, surely the Lord was here. And I knew it not. And he called the place Bethel, the house of God. Wait a minute. Doesn't that sound like where God and Jesus would be living? In their house? He said it's none other than the house of God. This connection, there's, there's this flow between heaven and earth. It's the house of God. Wait a minute. Now that sounds familiar. Know ye not that your body is the... Uh-oh. There should be a connecting flow between heaven and earth. There should be something, angels descending and descending. If you'll stay with me, we're going somewhere. There should be some kind of a flow between me and heaven all the time. Because if this is, if this is the house of God and I knew it not, how would I live my life if I really thought he was here? If I really thought <laughs> Jesus and Bubba were with me. Everywhere I went. How many would be scared? I wouldn't be very scared. Tell your neighbor you got back up. (laughs) Matter of fact, you can just watch because they've already whipped everything. They've already defeated everything. And they're already in control. They're already in authority. They're already owning everything. I was riding my horse yesterday up across the hills, and I kept hearing that scripture. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And then all of a sudden, it just hit me. He owns the hills too. 
My Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in it is his. We think we own stuff. We, think, we try to acquire land and stuff and cars and boats and junk and crap from Walmart. And, and Yeah. We hang it on our wall, and then we pay, and we store it for years because it's too good to throw away, but we really don't need it. It's out of style, and I don't want to give it away because, dear God, I don't want to give anything to anybody. They should pay something for it. And I know I'm not anywhere with y'all, but I looked up what people spend on storage units one year. That will scare you. Storing junk stuff. <laughs> I told you I'm going to take my time just be real. I did it one time. We had a storage shed. I paid, I paid, I can't remember what it was, 80 bucks a month for like three years. And I had all this stuff in it. A bunch of old trophies I'd won when I was a kid and, and all this stuff. And then my business failed and, and we went bankrupt and I couldn't pay it. And it's all gone. And I thought, why was I keeping it? What was I going to do with it? Keep some plastic trophies? So? Talk about the past, what I used to do, what I did when I was a kid, what, all that stuff. Or, or, or could I just live today? Could I just spend time with my kids? Could I say, what are we doing today, kids? What, what do you all want to do? What, what can we do together? Anybody ever live in the past? How many know? It's not good. I say it all the time. That's why the rear view mirror in your car is this big. And the windshield's this big because you need to be looking where you're going. I'm not trying to be mean or harsh this morning. There's just something jumping out, about, out of that scripture with me about making decisions. And if this is where we are, if this is my position with God, I don't need to beg for anything anymore. I remember when Paul White was here and he preached that message, If a Son Asks. It was the most watched message he had that year. On YouTube and everywhere else, I can't remember how many thousands of views that was. Came from right here in the middle of the United States, in Little Smith Center, Kansas. If a son asks. And he, he talks of the story about when a friend comes and knocks on the door. And, and, and that story has always been preached, you know, our persistent knocking. If we just keep begging God, if we keep bombarding heaven, if we keep asking God, finally he'll get irritated with us and he'll get up and answer the door in our prayer. And we miss it. A friend is out knocking on the door. Somebody needing something's out walking, knocking on the door. But where's the son? And he makes the illustration in the story. But if a son asks, Jesus is telling this story. He said, if a son asks, where would be the son in the story? In the middle of the night, he would have been laying right beside his dad. So when a son asks, does he need to keep pounding on the door, pounding on the door, pounding on the door, pounding on the door? Your problem is you don't know where you're at. Your problem is you think you're standing outside the door. Our problem is we keep thinking we're outside somewhere looking in instead of realizing we're inside looking out. I'm right here beside dad. I'm right here beside my father. I don't have to yell and scream and cry and beg God to do stuff. My whole prayer life changes. I just talk to him just like he's with me. There's a novel idea. Everybody say, Emmanuel, God with us. He's with me. He's with you. He's right here. The warfare is completed. It was completed 2,000 years ago. The problem is we just don't operate in our authority. How many of you have ever went to a boss or a parent or someone else, leadership, and you're, you're, you're pretty messed up or jacked up about something, and you tell them about the situation, and it's like, this is terrible. This is terrible. You just can't believe what happened. I mean, and this is going on, this, and they just look at you like, all right. And you're like, aren't you going to get up tight? Nope. Why? Because they see it from a different perspective. They, you go to your parents, you go to grandparents, you go to elders in your life. They've seen so much. The older I get, the more I like older people. <laughs> Imagine that. It's a big revelation, huh? The older I get, the more I like older people. Not because I'm getting older. 
But because I realized while I was young and dumb and being stupid, thinking I knew stuff, I was surrounded by people who knew stuff. And all I would have had to do was quit arguing with them and fighting with them or trying to get them to see it my way and said, how do you see this? And they would have said, well, just look here. I know you're, 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 you're in debt right now, but if you'll do this and this and this and this, you can get out of it. It's going to take you some time, but you can do this and this and this and this. I know this relationship's on the rocks, and it's just a disaster. But you know what will happen here. It's not as bad. See, look at it from up here. This is what it really looks like, and this is what's really going on. So get out of this flipped out, freak out the way you live and come up here with me. And let's look at this from the right angle. Does this make sense? I'm going to go on in some scriptures here, and I don't want, I want you to stay with me where we're at right now, okay, in this, 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 this setting, what I'm saying, because this is where it comes from. This is why I have such a passion about why true believers, true Christians don't act the way they used to act. See, because there's this mindset today, because there's so much grace being preached, it's gotten greasy, slimy. We call it greasy grace, cheap grace. Anything goes. Do whatever you want. God still loves you. He does still love you. But your life's not supposed to be that way. How many, when your kids are still being dingbats, do you still love them? But you'd rather them not be dingbats. You'd rather them not embarrass you in the store. Am I alone? You would rather them behave. You'd rather them represent because that's what they're doing. They're from your loins. So everywhere they go, they're hauling your billboard around. He's my dad. She's my mom. And so you want them to act right, don't you? Now, just think. If we're that way and we're made in the image of God, I wonder if God's that way. Not that God's got to be like us. No, we should be like Him. But if this is how we are, and He made us, there's probably a good chance He'd like us to behave. He'd like us to represent Him in the kingdom pretty well, wouldn't He? Doesn't that make sense? So I'm not being mean, and it's not being critical or law-based or anything like that. When, when you expect people, if they really understand who they are and whose they are, their actions will follow. Make sense? If you're from the royal family, how many know the way you sit at the table is different? You know where the silverware is. You know how things would be. You, you, you have manners. Amen? Because you're of the royal family. That's not bad. See, what we've done in society today is we've made all that evil and bad. The man, kill the man. We want to get rid of the man. I mean, you know, God created the man. And he said, let man have dominion. As high as a bird can fly, as deep as a fish can swim. He said, I want you to have dominion and multiply. Multiply what? Multiply him in the earth not multiply the earth into God. See, this is what we've done. This is what's happening in Christianity if we, if we don't pay attention. We, we've, we've slimed it up. We've greased it up so bad that you can't tell the difference between believers and non-believers. Spencer, bring those verses back up if you would. Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 1. If then... Everybody say, if then. How many believe you were raised with Christ? Isn't that good news? That's awesome. You're seated with him in heavenly places. That's where you sit. According to God, you have all authority of heaven and heaven was given to him. And then he left it with us. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is. 
sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. That doesn't mean I'm just thinking of heaven someday. I'm thinking up here. I'm, I'm all up in the spirit realm all the time, and I, I can't be any earthly good because I'm too heavenly minded. That's not what that means. It says set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. In other words, don't focus on the situation in this earthly realm from the earth's perspective. Set, it, set your mind on things above. Get the perspective and like you're, you're seeing it from, from heaven, from this position. Does that make sense? Stay with me. Not on things on the earth. Go ahead. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. He's talking to people who are alive, just like I'm talking to you this morning. And he's telling them, you died. You died in Adam, the old Adamic nature, nature, the old Adamic flesh-minded fleshiness works and, 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 and fleshiness, it all died with him. And your life is hidden with Christ in God, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, if you're in him and he's in you, then how many know they should see him, not you? He should appear. Where, how's he going to appear? He's just going to appear in the clouds someday. He's going to blow in and it'll be angel dust in the revival. See, that's what we've made this stuff. We've made it freaky and weird. It's not freaky and weird. How's he appear? Through you. Because you are the temple. You are the house of God. He appears in his temple, in his holy habitation. Where does he abide? He abides in you and me. When Christ appears, who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, Put to death your members which are on the earth. Here we go. Are you in the royal family still? Are you still seated up here with him or not? Because, see, that all sounded real good until we get to the greasy grace mind. And then it's like, no, I can do anything I want. I mean, I like that greasy grace stuff. And the next thing you know, you're turning back around like this going, God, would you please do this? Would you? No, if you're going to be in the family, tell your neighbor, suck it up and be in the family. Suck it up, buttercup. There's perks to being in the family. Amen? I, I give you all the perks first. Now I'm going to give you a whole other set of perks because these are perks. These are not bad things because the minute you get on stuff where you start telling people, you need to crucify that, you need to drop that attitude, you need to quit doing this and this, they're like, Psh, don't get on me, man. I'm under grace. Put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication. That's having sex outside of marriage. I said it out loud. Uncleanliness. What? Be no skank dirty. Take a bath. I mean, I'm reading your Bible to you. I'm not, I didn't make this up. Uncleanliness. Passion. Wait a minute. I can't have any passion. No, you can have passion in the right way. Evil desire. Who did he say put, who's supposed to put to death that? Him or me? I'm supposed to put it to death. Well, I just can't do it, Pastor. Where are you sitting? Are you sitting out here? I just can't do it. God, please help me. God, please. No. I just told you where you're sitting. You can do all things. Through who? Oh, rich. I'm rich and increased with goods. And Passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Wish I had his boat. Wish I had his tractor, combine, wife, which is idolatry. Keep going. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. That's not you and me. We're the sons of obedience. Amen? In which you yourselves once walked. You used to live like this. You used to have, and, live, and you live down here at this level. Say lower level. See, we love that song. I got friends in lower places where the whiskey drowns and the beer chases my blues away. Isn't that neat? How many ever had the whiskey chase your blues away? Or did, were they right there the next morning? Only now you had more blues because you wonder what you did. 
Come on. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be holier than thou. I'm trying to get you to understand. God made a way for us to live an abundant life and to be part of a royal priesthood, a kingdom on the earth that can declare and make decisions and to rule and reign. Because you know what the biggest problem in our world is? The same one from the beginning. And they all want control. I will exalt my throne above his throne. No, I just want to go sit on his throne. There's where I'm at in my life. I'm going to stay with his throne because his throne's above every other throne. His name's above every name. I'll take his name. Amen? He can be my dad. I'll put his name on my life. Come on. In which you yourselves once walked then, and you, you lived in them. Now keep going. But now, everybody say now. You yourselves are to put off these things. There's another list. Oh, God, i got to put off more stuff. No. You don't have that stuff. This is how you are. You used to be like this. And I'm going to give you the list of what you used to be. See, your problem is you don't know who you are. Tell your neighbor you don't know who you are. But you're learning. Put off these things. Anger. Wrath. <laughs> Come on. Malice. Blasphemy. Filthy language out of your mouth. Oh, great. I like my preacher to cuss. That's just like Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm just reading your Bible to you. Verse 9. Come on. Do not lie to one another. What? We can't lie. We get so mad when people lie to us. wonder why. Because we want everybody else to act like this while we got our stuff and our attitude. The pastor, he needs to live up here. Or we want him to come down here. And then we're all just good old boys. Amen. And no power, no authority, flipping out, bar fighting, brawling, dingbat people, responding to stuff. And now we got a thug life society that we're all living in because we forgot who we are. Remember when people used to be presidential? You used to think there were people that were intelligent. Pray for your pastor. I'm trying to stay in one place. Stay in my lane. Stay up here. Yeah. Rich said stay here. See? These are the kind of friends you want. They're always on me. Want me to straighten up and act right. Stay with them. Thank them for getting in your stuff. Thank them for saying, you don't act like that. You go to my church. We don't do that. Where's the amens? There we go. It's not the church you're representing. It's him. It used to be presidential. There used to be people that you could confront them with truth, and they wouldn't hit you with the F-bomb eight times and call you, oh, you're racist. You're a homophobe. You're this. You're that. No. It's just the truth. Amen? Do it in love. Do it with integrity. Have you ever had somebody just cut you up in little diced up pieces and hand yourself back to you on a plate and do it with a smile on their face and integrity and never used a cuss word? That's what I'm talking about. You can do that from here. We're not supposed to be mean. But when you understand who you are, I don't have to stoop to your level. See, we like these memes on Facebook that says never argue with an idiot. Why? Because they'll drag you down to their level. And they'll beat you because they've got all the experience down here. You're used to being up here. And they drag you down in here in the thug life. And they'll street fight and just whip your hind end because you're trying to fight on their level. Don't fight on their level. Say, no. You want to fight? Come up here. Why? Because I got all the backing I need right here. And I'm not going to stoop to that. When the enemy comes in and starts messing with your mind, you're not this, you're not that, you're this and this and this, I don't think so. You missed it. <laughs> you're seeing me from the wrong perspective, devil. Here's where I am. 
It's what happened in the garden. The enemy came to Eve, the soulish side. He came to the, our mind, will, and emotions, and he said, hey, if you do this stuff, you'll be like him. When our Bible says that she was already made in his image. She was living in a garden, a finished work. God finished the garden. And he said, now just have dominion. Just dress and keep what I've already made for you. What Eve should have said was, get out of my face, Jack. I'm just like him. Don't we look alike? Look at us. Are we okay? So we wonder why we have a powerless church and we wonder why things aren't happening. It's because we're stooping down to the earth's level with everything. We've lowered everything down to the earth or lowered it down to fleshy living, fleshy stuff, sensual stuff, seeker-friendly everything instead of know, know who you are. Convince people of who they are in Christ and they'll rise to the occasion. Because if you truly believe you're of the royal family, if you truly believe of who you are in Him... How many know you'll act like it? The actions will follow. But when we keep lowering everything to the world standards and lowering everything, and we, we do it because we don't understand our position. Go ahead, next verse. I think there's, what did I give you? 310? And have put on the new man. Uh-oh. The new man. Everybody say the new man. I'm a new man. Put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the What? image. Where's Christ? <laughs> Seated at the right hand of the Father. Where are you? I'm with him. There's the image I need to have of myself and him. Put on the new man who is renewed, renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Can I just put some modern day stuff in here? Male or female, black or white, Rich or poor, status, no status, in Christ, we're all up here. So the people we don't like, they're up here too. Circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, or whatever that word is, <laughs> slave nor free. There's no more slaves or free. We're all free. But Christ is all and in how many? Hmm. If he's in me and he's in you, how many know we really shouldn't be trying to live on a lower level? I think I'm going to stop. I've got another set of verses. Well, you want to stop? You want to go? You, you mad at me? Do you know where you are? Where's Christ? Where's you? Next time you're ready, give somebody a piece of your mind. Remember the last time God gave you a piece of his mind like that. Did he ever do that with you? If it was, it wasn't God. Now, God sits here like a good father. And he says, now listen, calm down. Everything's going to be all right. You may have to change. You may have to control yourself. You're going to have to put away all that stuff because you're part of the family. And we don't act like that. Matter of fact, it's not that we're acting. We aren't that way. We don't do that in my house. See, that's, we always see that as a threat or this we're better than somebody. No, it's not that. It's the privilege of knowing that we can rest in him. We can rest in this position that I don't have to be afraid anymore. I used to say it because of where we lived. If your dad was Sam Walton, we lived where the headquarters of Walmart is. If your dad was Sam Walton, would you worry about all the stuff all these other people are worried about? Would you worry about paying your bills? Would you worry about what who said what about you? You don't care. You own the house they're living in. You own half the town, and you control all of it. That was just in one little town, in one little rich guy on this globe. It was a speck on a globe. 
But that becomes their whole world. That can become our whole world. We do the same thing. We, our, our, our little problem, our little life, it just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger because we focus on that problem and we put that problem up like this, like this, like this, like this, instead of worrying, realizing, back it up. Wait a minute, back up, back up, back up. Oh, that's not as big a deal as I thought it was. Matter of fact, how do I need to respond to this? Let's go to, where'd we stop? Verse 10. Let's keep going. There in Colossians. Therefore, everybody say therefore. Now that we got all this figured out, are we all good still? Where we're seated, who we are, what we put away, that's not who we are. And because of all that, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, here's what you do. Here's how you respond. Everybody say, just like your father. God's never going to ask you to do what he don't do. He's never going to ask you to respond any other way than he responds. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. You mad at me yet? I'm reading your Bible. Bearing with one another. I struggle with that. Can I be honest? I'm not going to confess all my problems here because I've been down there too long and God's on my case about getting up here. You understand what I'm saying? Even as a pastor, I like to keep it real, but there's a fine line between keeping it real and living in lower places. Amen? Bearing with the the reason, (laughs) don't say it. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Why? Because here's where you're sitting. Either you are or you aren't. So you can't sit in both places. Does that make sense? Go ahead. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of what? She just thinks she's perfect. You can all be perfect. I just put on love. It's the bond of perfection, completeness. Verse 15. And let the peace of God rule. Everybody say rule. Your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Wisdom is Knowing how to apply knowledge. There's knowledge, which is knowing a lot of stuff, and wisdom. The word wisdom means basically how knowing how to apply the knowledge you have. So let the word of Christ dwell in you in all knowing how to apply this knowledge, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whose name? My name or his name? I'm representing. Tell your neighbor, you're representing. Give thanks to God the Father through him. That's how we respond. If you want to know how to respond, this is how we respond. Do I like it in the flesh? No, my flesh is screaming like a devil. And if I keep feeding my flesh, it's just matter and matter. I can't believe it. I'm supposed to kill that. Because I have authority to kill that fleshiness, to kill that mindset in me. And I need to get back up here in my position. By the way, I'm not picking on any of y'all. I don't know your stuff. This is what he dealt with me this week. (laughs) As your pastor. Now that's keeping it real. Amen. But I got to change. I got to get in my. I got to get in the right position. If we're gonna, if we, if if I'm gonna be successful in Him, because that's success. I got to represent the family. That's not works. That's knowing who I am. See, it's still never about works. The works will follow. They'll just be a natural flow out of who you are. 
I don't have to tell you who you are. The natural part of you should just flow out of you and I. And if we understand we have now been made to sit in heavenly places, we are now seated at the right hand of God as far as God's concerned and spiritual perspective. This is where we are. We can operate from this realm in this earth. That's what Jesus came and did. Next time somebody at your work brings somebody in naked, so to speak, and throws them down at your feet, caught in the act of adultery, respond like Jesus did. He freaked them out. He didn't start fighting with them, shoving them back. F you. No, what about you? you, you, you. No. What did he do? Is this too real? I hate that word. There are certain groups of people, they know two words. The F-bomb and raceless. It's all their response to everything is. Those are people living down there. Anyway, Jesus just sits there quietly, and they're like, the law says this is what we ought to do. We ought to do, do, do. Stands down. He's turning right in the dirt. I'm not sure what he wrote. I'd like to find out. I'm going to ask him. I think he was writing the addresses of the guys that had her there. Because he probably knew she'd been to their house. And then he stands up and he says, All right. You without sand cast the first stone. And all the rocks start dropping. Because like the writer said, you used to live there too. I used to respond just like that. But now that I know who I am, I can't respond that way anymore. Amen? Amen? And they drop the rocks and they slowly just begin to walk away. And it gets real quiet. How many know it gets quiet when truth's spoken? Kind of like in here. And kind of like in my quiet time with God when he says this stuff to me and I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> And he looks at her and he said, well, where's your accusers? She said, I don't, I don't have any. He said, now you're seeing it from the way I see it. Don't be that way to me. That's not really who you are. Bow your heads if you would. Father, I thank you for this word today. I thank you for the truth of it that sets us free. I thank you that the truth of knowing who we are and whose we are and knowing the position that we have. Man. Let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. You've given us that. You said that for us to renew our minds by the washing of the word. Let this word resonate within us and just wash us and flush us and help us to put away the uncleanliness and all the other stuff of the way we think. And see it from this perspective And know that I don't have to respond. To the stupid people like the, the joke I made, God. About never argue with stupid people. Help us to remember we don't, we don't have to do that. We don't have to engage. We don't have to get freaked out when we watch the news. It's all fake anyway. 
When the enemy throws something in our face, whatever way, shape, or form, we just remember where we're seated and who won and who's really in control. And we speak from that position, not in arrogance, not in cockiness. But God help us to just humbly know our position, know whose we are and who we are. And respond in that way. Let us live lives of integrity, I pray. And I speak death to the lie that has been sold to us that you can't have any fun unless you act like an idiot. I'm just being real, God. We all know it's not true. You have a life that is beyond our imagination. You have a life of fullness and success and peace and joy, the things you cannot buy. I come against that mindset. I just, I thank you that we're waking up to the reality that this stuff's never going to make us happy. Status is never going to do it. Likes, followers, opinions. That we're accepted in the beloved. We're right here. We are to have dominion and to rule and reign in this life. As kings and priests unto our God. That's what your word says. And that's who we are. And I thank you for us coming alive to that today. Thank you for, for, for reminding us today. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you for allowing us to, to enjoy and partake of the things in this life, in this world. For the time we're here. Help us to be good stewards of it. Thank you for the privilege we have to enjoy things and, and life and the land and all the opportunities that you give us. Help us to remember that we're all in Christ. You were reconciling the world to yourself that day. You were evening the books. You were leveling the playing field. Help us to walk out of here alive, confident, not arrogant, confident, walking in peace and love that passes all understanding everywhere we go. When we walk in the room, it's like a fresh drink of water on a hot day. I give you praise. If you agree with me, say amen. Amen. Are we all right? Thank you all for watching online. Appreciate you and all your support. Share this if you would. We always say this. I'm going to say it probably every week. The only thing we ask is if this ministry blesses, encourages you, that it there's a good chance it will someone else. And so we just ask you to like and share it. Help us to get the word out. We're just trying to bring life to people. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.